So there was supposed to be a translation, but it didn't work. So I have no idea what you think is about to happen. <laughs> I, I was sitting back there and, and, and remembering the first time that I came out to talk about a book, and it was in 2005. I'd had my first book published, and the publisher invited me to come to London to speak at Wembley Arena uh, for, uh, as the opening act to a man named Dr. Wayne Dyer. Anybody know who Wayne Dyer is? So Wayne Dyer was sort of Tony Robbins before Tony Robbins. And I was very excited about this. I mean, I was going to be playing a, a, a huge arena, 3,000 people in the audience, and, and opening for one of my heroes. And, and so I called my mother, because I thought, ah, I'm finally going to impress my mother. Right? And I said, Mom, you'll never guess what. I'm going to open for Wayne Dyer at Wembley Arena. And she said, oh my goodness, that's wonderful. Who's Wayne Dyer? And I said, okay, okay. I, 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 I said, imagine like I'm in a band. And, and it would be like I was being asked to open for the Rolling Stones. And she said, oh, wow. Who are the Rolling Stones? <laughs> now, part of the problem is my mother has no idea what I do. I mean, she knows I'm a coach. And she knows it's a good thing. But she doesn't really know what that means. And as best as I can explain it, what a coach does is a coach helps you get more out of yourself than you can get on your own. A coach helps an athlete get more out of themselves they can get on their own. A, a coach will help you get more out of your life than you would get on your own. And that's what I've done for the last 30 years. But in the last 10 years, the way that I have gone about doing that has changed dramatically. And the book, that, The Inside Out Revolution, which I'm just thrilled is, 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 is out here now, is, is my, my first attempt at sharing what it is I've seen about what does bring out the best in people. What does allow us to be at our best more of the time. How do we get more out of ourselves? How do we get more out of others? How do we get more out of our life? How do we unleash our potential? And what I'd like to invite you to do is I'd like to invite you to be my client tonight. So instead of worrying about, oh, you know, taking notes about something or gathering some abstract ideas, I want you to just pretend it's just, it's just us, just you and me, right, in my office. Right? My dog's over there, right? And we're just having a chat. And we're having a chat about you, about your life. And, and there's a couple of things that I know about you without knowing you. If you're anything like almost everyone who walks through my office door, you're a bit preoccupied with something, right? You got something really on your mind, maybe a bunch of somethings. There's some problem that you're chewing on that you just can't quite get out of your head and you can't quite work out what to do about. Maybe it's something to do with your family. Maybe it's something to do with your business. Maybe it's something to do with your country. Maybe it's something to do with nothing to do with that, your health. But chances are there's something that you're overthinking. Right? Now there's another thing that I pretty much know is true about you without knowing you, without getting to have a two-way conversation, which is what I would normally do. And that is that you massively underestimate what's possible. You massively underestimate what you're capable of. Because your estimate of what you're capable of is pretty much based on a combination of what you've done so far and what your parents told you. And even if your parents told you, you're capable of anything, even if your teachers told you, you're amazing, chances are you didn't believe them. They were just being nice. Right? Now, because of that, we live in a very small circle of what's possible. And we do our best in our very small circle to do our best. 
But we don't see that, that one of my coaches described it like this. He said, it's really easy to live a masterpiece of a life on a postage stamp of possibility. Well, what I want to suggest is that our potential is unlimited. It's the nature of potential. I come from a family of scientists. And in physics, there's potential energy and kinetic energy. In other words, there's the potential for anything to happen, and then there's what happens. I was talking about this in a lecture once in New York, and one of my daughters was in the audience. And I got very excited about potential, because I do, because it excites me to look at people and know they have no idea how much they're capable of. They have no idea how much easier their life could be than it probably seems, how much better it can get, not just on the outside, but experientially. And I was talking to this group, and I, I, I've been told, by the way, that I can swear in Greece. So if, if, if I was told wrong, let me just apologize now. But I was talking to the group, and I, was, I, was, I, got, I got carried away, and I was like, you are the infinite creative potential of the entire fucking universe. And my daughter at the back immediately tweeted it. Is that you are the infinite creative potential of the entire fucking universe, hashtag my dad. <laughs> right? But that's the starting point. The starting point is anything is possible. The question is, why don't our lives reflect that more? Why doesn't our performance at work reflect that more? Why doesn't our volume of creative ideas reflect that more? Why doesn't the quality of our relationships reflect that more? Why doesn't our joy reflect that more? If anything is possible, if our potential is infinite, why do we stay stuck in our own little circle of possibility? And there are answers to that. And those answers are to do with the way the mind works and our misunderstanding of that. And so that's what I want to take some time tonight to speak to you about. That's what I would be speaking with you about if you were in my office. Now, where we would begin is with how to listen. Now, I hope you're going to allow me, you're going to indulge me talking to you about listening. I know you know how to listen, right? In fact, there's kind of nothing to it. Right? You can't not listen without going, nah, 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 nah. right? Sound comes in. But most people are, are trained to listen in certain ways that are socially very nice, but aren't terribly helpful for learning. So one of the ways that we're trained to listen, that we're conditioned to listen, is to affirm, to agree. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. You know, we're, we're sort of taught to listen to, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, mm, mm, good idea. Oh, I, oh, we, we, it's almost we listen as though we're hoping to have sex with the person when they're done talking, right? That's not helpful because you're not really listening, you're projecting energy, you're projecting listening, right? You're showing that you're listening. Now, another way that a lot of us have been conditioned to listen is to argue. So we listen for the weak points in the argument. We listen for the thing that was said a little bit different to the way we know it is. We listen for the, the flaw. And we go, ha ha! When it's my turn, I'm going to get him. Right? Well, that's not helpful either. Right? So there are a few things that are very helpful, universally helpful, especially when you're in this kind of a conversation, a conversation about potential, a conversation about possibility, not a conversation about facts and figures, but a conversation about what's going on behind the scenes in the mind. Do you have the movie The Wizard of Oz here? You know the, the movie The Wizard of Oz? Well, there's a scene in The Wizard of Oz where the mighty wizard is being mighty and scaring people. 
and the dog runs over to the curtain and pulls back the curtain and the man's back there moving the levers and goes, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Well, tonight, we're going to pay attention to what's going on behind the curtain. We're going to attend to what's going on in the human mind that causes us to have the kinds of experiences we have, that allows us to be at our best some of the time, and makes us into complete idiots some of the time. And in order to hear about that, because it's kind of a conversation about your own mind, you do have to listen a little differently. And so here's a few things that I found helpful. One, listen for a description, not a prescription. And I'll say what I mean by that. We're used to listening for what to do, right? Give me a prescription. Tell me what to do. One of the worst coaching sessions I ever did, right? It was terrible. Was with one of the wealthiest women in the world. And I was sitting down, I was very excited to get the chance to speak with her, and, and, I, and I was kind of trying to get behind the curtain, but she kept wanting to know what to do about her career, and what to do about this, and what to do about all the various situations in her life. And it got to the point where she was so wanting the prescription and not interested in the description that she said, just tell me what to fucking do, and I'll fucking do it! And I was like, well, I think you should ask me to leave. <laughs> now she settled down, because people do. And we had a great conversation. But ultimately, the conversation that moves the needle, that makes a difference, is a conversation where you see what is already true. Because if you know what's already true, you can work with it. If you don't understand what's already true, you can run around making things up all day long. In fact, my old career in psychology, that was my specialty, right? We talked about it as reframing. We talked about it as a positive attitude. We talked about it as having a great perspective and a healthy attitude. But really, what we were talking about was the most useful lie. What's the most useful lie I can tell myself to trick myself into doing well? What's the mo most useful lie I can tell the people on my team to trick them into performing at their best? But the problem with that is you kind of know you're a liar, right? There's a, there's a phenomenon in psychology that's often talked about as imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is where you, you feel like a fake. No matter how successful you are in the eyes of the world, you feel like a phony. You feel like a fraud. You worry that one day you'll be found out and people will find you out. Is it familiar? This means yes, by the way. That means no, yeah? So here's the thing. If you're continually faking it till you make it and trying to tell yourself the most useful lie, the reason you feel like a phony is because you are one. That's what you're doing. So there's something really powerful about getting back to what's true, about getting back to the simplicity of what's true, and not what's true for you, well, this is my truth, this is my truth, this is the American truth, this is the Greek truth. What's just true for human beings? What is a principle, a fundamental principle? It doesn't change depending on where you're from, how old you are, if you're male or female, what country you live in, whether you believe it or not. Gravity is a principle. Right? You don't have to believe in gravity for it to work. You don't have to know about gravity for it to work. There is nothing you can do to turn off gravity. It's fundamental. And when you have something fundamental, you don't have to worry about it. Right? How many of you worried about gravity today? Right? Nobody, because there's nothing to worry about. It's just gravity. Right? It just is. Some stuff is just true. And what I want to encourage you to listen for is the ring of truth, that recognition we all have when something is just true, even if it's different to what we thought before 
even if it's different to what we've been taught, even if it's different to what we've read in a different book, we kind of know truth. We kind of recognize it. So I want to encourage you to listen for it. Listen for that ring of truth. You'll know. You'll recognize it. The last thing that, that I want to share that, that people seem to find very helpful is when all else fails, just listen. Don't listen for something. Don't listen to make sense of it. Don't listen to figure it out. Just li- listen like you would listen to a nice piece of music. You're not trying to learn anything from the music. You're not trying to understand the music. You're not trying to work it out. You're just listening. And you're kind of letting it wash over you. And when it does, it does something for you. That's why we listen to music. So as best you can, just listen tonight the way you might listen to music. Does that make sense? So I heard a yes, I heard a no. I'm going to go with the yes, but if it's a no, don't worry about it. Just listen. That's kind of the point. You don't have to make sense of this. It's either true or it isn't. And you'll sense the truth if it's true. So what I know to do, somebody once described the process of talking about truth, having a a meaning. So I call the work that I do transformative coaching. And I call the conversation that I have with people a transformative conversation. Now that's as opposed to a helpful one. It usually is helpful to people, but helpful is usually, here is my problem, tell me what to do. Oh, that helped. Transformative is it literally changes you in participating. You literally start to function from a different place. One of my heroes, and I'm not just sucking up to you because you're Greek, is Archimedes. Archimedes, when we grew up in our family, Archimedes was like a folk hero. And the two stories about Archimedes that always resonated with me as a kid were the the famous one where he got in the bath and the water overflowed the sides of the bath and he figured out he could work out whether the, the crown was made of gold or a, or, or a fake metal by putting it in the water and seeing the density. And, and he got so excited, so the story goes, at his sudden insight that he went running naked through the streets going, Eureka, Eureka, I found it! That insight, that capacity to see something from nothing, To be totally lost and suddenly know, that's actually one of the most reliable built-in aspects to the mind. And yet we don't rely on it. We rarely rely on insight. What we try to rely on instead is figuring it out. What we try to rely on instead is our intellect, our database, our spreadsheets. I, I, I had a conversation with a friend and he's, a, he's an engineer and he's very successful and he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. But his son was going through an emotional crisis. His son was depressed, they were concerned he was suicidal. He knew I had been a depressed, suicidal teen and so he asked me for help. And I, I, I talked to him and I said, what, what have you done? And he took out his spreadsheet And he'd worked out a spreadsheet. Well, we've tried this, and we're going to try this, and we're thinking this, and the pros are this, and the cons are this. And that's how we problem solve. That's how we've trained ourselves to get through life, is by trying to work it all out logically. But have you noticed that life isn't logical? Have you noticed that other people don't behave in a totally logical manner from time to time? They're a little bit more unpredictable than that. I had a physics teacher, and the way he explained it is he said, if, if I kick a football, a soccer ball, football, football, you know football. If I kick a football, and you know my leg speed and the, the, the air speed, and that we can work out exactly where that ball is going to wind up. But if I kick a dog, 
there's no telling where it's going to end up. Because a dog is part of a living system. Human beings, that's you, that's me, we're part of a living system. We aren't predictable in that way. But when we try to treat ourselves as they are, when we try to treat other people as though they should be, why did you do that? I said the right thing. Why did you respond like that? Why are you upset? I did what you asked me to. We don't work that way. We operate on a different system. We're alive. And the fact that we're alive is a lot more significant than we give it credit for. We take that for granted. Right? This is an odd question, but has anyone ever been around a dead body? A surprising number of people. I remember when my father died, being shocked at the funeral. Because even though his body was there, I realized he wasn't there. I could tell, I could feel it. The life bit was missing. The aliveness was missing. One of the things that every human being in this room has in common is that's alive in us. There is an aliveness in us. That aliveness actually has a life of its own. That animates us. It's the animating spirit. It has an intelligence to it. There is an intelligence to how the body works. Right? Why do we throw up when we throw up? We throw up because there's something in the body that's toxic, and the body is trying to get it out. Right? Why do we get a fever? Because, again, something in the body, there's a toxicity, and the body is trying to burn it out. If we cut our finger, right, there's an intelligence in the body that heals it. If that's for me, could you tell them I'm giving a talk? I just didn't. There's an intelligence to it. We, we kind of know we don't have to go, OK, how am I going to heal this? Let me create a spreadsheet. OK, I'm going to take the blood. I'm going to limit the amount of. We kind of know the system's got it. The intelligence of the system already knows what to do. We can see it in nature. Right? One of the things in nature is that, have you noticed that an acorn always becomes an oak tree? It never becomes a pine tree. It never becomes a baby cow. It always becomes what is already inside it. There's one of the fascinating things. We went to a national park in America. And I know you guys have had some pretty big fires here. We live in California. We've had some pretty big fires there recently. And one of the things about fires that I didn't know is there was a period of 10 years in America where they eliminated all forest fires. And it almost killed the forests. Because part of the intelligence of nature is that the debris, the detrius, burns off, and that allows for new growth. Once they understood that, they were able to devise a way of working with the forest, working with the intelligence of nature, to control the fires, to limit the amount of damage they would do in populated areas, but not to try and eliminate them. In other words, when we understand how it already works, we can work with it. But when we don't understand how something works, we inevitably work against it. And then because we don't know we're working against it, we work harder and harder and harder. I had a friend who was a flight instructor with the Navy. And he told me about sort of his most dramatic experience working with a pilot. And he said he wished that this only happened one time. But he always remembers the first time it happened. And one of the things when you're going for your pilot right rating is at a certain point, you have to go out on your first solo flight. And part of your first solo flight is you have to stall the plane. So you have to stop the engine. And when you stop the engine on an airplane, it starts to dive. And it's very important. The first thing you have to do is level the plane out before you start the engine back up. Because if you start the engine, when you're going down, you just go down faster. That's bad. right? Now, Every pilot learns this, but when you're in the moment, you kind of get a little caught up in the moment, 
right? When your plane's going down, you get a little preoccupied, right? You're not always at your best. So this one particular pilot that he was working with, and my friend Bill, he was in the tower, and this, 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 the, 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 the pilot stalls the plane, plane starts to go down, he can't level it out. He goes, mayday, mayday, I can't, I, 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 emergency, I can't, I can't level the plane out. And Bill says, let go of the controls. The guy goes, negative, negative, the plane is, is going to crash. I need, I, I, need, I, I need help, I need help. This is an emergency. Let go of the controls. Negative, you don't understand. This is life or death. Bill said, this is life or death. Let go of the controls. Now, something got through to the pilot. He let go of the controls. He'd forgotten there's a gyroscope built into the plane. As soon as he let go of the controls, the plane leveled itself out. Then he was able to restart it, and he's able to fly home. When you understand what's already built in, you can work with it instead of against it. Another thing Archimedes talked about, a quote that's attributed to him at least, is give me a long enough lever and a place to stand, and I can move the world. And most people hear that, and they think in terms of leverage. How do I get more leverage? How do I leverage more out of my people? How do I leverage more out of myself? How do I leverage more out of what I've got? But for me, the bit of that quote that's so powerful is the place to stand. You need solid ground if you're going to move the world. You need a place to stand if you're going to move yourself. You need a place to stand if you're going to move others. And solid ground is that which is constant, that which is always true, that which will always be true. It is foundational. It is a principle like gravity, like electricity, like magnetism. They just are. You can like them, not like them, think they're good, think they're bad, use them for good, use them for evil, but they just are. When it comes to human beings, there are three principles. There are three things that are fundamentally true about all people. And as you understand that, it lets you work with them instead of against them. One of them we've just been talking about. One of them is the fact that we are alive, that there is an aliveness in us. There is an intelligence in us. We can see that intelligence throughout nature, but we somehow think it skipped human nature. Right? Oh yeah, I know the flowers are going to be fine. Yeah, I understand the forest is going to be okay. I might even understand my body is going to do its best to take care of itself, although it is a body. And like anything in nature, it will eventually wear out. But I think with my mind, I'm on my own. I think I'm responsible for figuring everything out up here. I have to control the plane. I've got to control my thoughts. I've got to control my mind. Not realizing that the mind has a built-in gyroscope. It has a built-in self-correcting mechanism. We're already designed to adapt and thrive. That's why whenever circumstances change, at first people struggle, right? They struggle to adjust. They struggle to try and make sense of it. They fight against what's happened. They resist it. They try to, they hope to change it. But the moment they stop, the moment they give up or accept or surrender, things have a way of working themselves out. We settle down. New ideas start to come to mind. We start to notice that while we still miss the old, there's some pretty cool stuff about the new. And life moves forward. It's built into us. But we don't rely on it. We try to rely on this. We try to rely on the brain. We try to rely on if your brain's big enough, you can conquer anything. But have you noticed that the people with the biggest brains do the stupidest things? This wasn't designed for living systems. 
It works great with math. It works great with physics. It works great with facts. It's not designed to operate in a living system on its own. The mind, in that sense, the brain, makes a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. There is an intelligence inside you, behind the mind. As you start to see that, as you start to allow that to steer, you'll find yourself filled with fresh ideas. You'll find yourself knowing what to do without knowing how you know. You've all had experiences like that. We tend to call them flow experiences, where we just somehow, without even thinking about it, know what to do. Or we make a decision and we call it a no-brainer. And it literally was a no-brainer. You didn't need this. You just knew. That knowing is built into us. But we've learned to ignore it or subjugate it to the intellect. It's just not how we're made. It's not how we're designed. And so while we can kind of make it work sometimes, we're working against reality instead of with it. We're working against nature instead of with it. Make sense? Second principle. Human beings are conscious. We are aware. Not of everything. And sometimes we can be pretty distracted. Right? Have you ever been so in your head that you did something incredibly stupid that afterwards you couldn't quite understand like how, you, how it happened? Like my ultimate one, and I think I actually wrote about this one in the book. I used to, many years ago, be an actor. And I went in on, on an audition. And I was auditioning for the part of a, of a young man who, who, in the scene, was proposing to a girl. And being a creative actor, I, I had my real wedding ring on. And I took my wedding ring off to use it in the scene. And I proposed to the girl with my wedding ring. And it all went very well. She said yes. And, and I, went, I went home after, after the audition. And I was saying, oh, that was great. And I looked at my hand. And I went, oh, shit. I'd left the wedding ring. And I went back. And of course, they were already on to the next actor. And I didn't know what to do. Because it's the rudest thing in the world to interrupt an audition. But I thought it was kind of given the choice between that or going home without a wedding ring to my wife. Maybe I'd just interrupt the audition. And they were really sweet about it. They really were. They were really helpful. They stopped everything. Everybody went looking for the ring. Until about five minutes in, somebody said, what's that on your finger? I was so in my head, I didn't notice that my ring was already back on my finger. Right? That's how a lot of us live. We live so in our thoughts, so in our head, that we struggle. To, it's amazing we can do anything, let alone everything. It's amazing we function at all, given how distracted we are by our own thoughts. But we have the capacity to notice. That's what consciousness is. It's the capacity to see, the capacity to be aware. It's the capacity to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Without consciousness, we'd have no way of knowing if anything was happening. Now, consciousness, we know even when the body is asleep, consciousness continues. It's measurable. Well, that's part of our capacity as human beings, but we take it for granted. It's, yeah, 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 I got consciousness. Well, consciousness is what allows us to learn. It's what allows us to get insights. It's what allows us to see what's really going on when we're not blinded by our own thinking. I wrote a book about consciousness called The Space Within. And in that book, I talk about how in life, there's really kind of only one problem, and there's kind of only one solution. And the only real problem in life is we get so caught up in thought that we lose touch with this deeper intelligence. We lose touch with this capacity for fresh thought. We lose touch 
with this capacity for insight. And so the only solution is to allow the mind to settle back down. And then we're right back in touch. The plane levels back out. The mind settles back down. Do you have the game tetherball here? So it's a game, I don't know, maybe you've got a different name for it, but so there's a pole and there's a ball on a rope and you hit the ball and it goes round and it kind of winds around the pole and somebody's usually on the other side hitting it the other way and it tries to go like that. You can imagine it at least. Well, our thinking's kind of like a tether ball. It gets, we get wound up, we wind ourselves up, we drive ourselves crazy thinking about something. Yeah, but what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? And we get wound tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And we think, I need to do something to unwind, right? So we drink or we watch TV or we go shopping or we do whatever we've learned to do to unwind. Not realizing that the second you stop hitting the tetherball, it unwinds all by itself. Well, that's how the mind works. The second we stop winding ourselves up, we unwind. It takes seconds. But because we're used to kind of thinking about how to unwind, we wind ourselves up tighter and tighter. We're used to, I need to relax. Right? That works, right? You know? I need to relax harder. You know? As if somehow the harder you tried, the more likely it is to work. Right? It doesn't work that way. It's not you. It's not a failing of you. It's not how the mind works. The intelligence already has this. And as you start to notice it, as your capacity, your consciousness starts to notice it, it automatically self-corrects. It's like a thermostat, right? If a thermostat is working, it notices the temperature. And when the temperature gets too hot, it kicks on the cooling. And if the temperature gets too cold, it kicks on the heat. You don't have to do it. It's built in. But imagine you didn't understand thermostats, right? And so every time it got cold, you lit a fire in the room. And every time it got hot, you, you did whatever. You brought in fans and opened windows and brought in ice or did whatever. You would think, you would even argue, you would even think you had proof that there's no intelligence behind this. I've got to do this myself. I've got to make this happen. If I want it to heat up, I've got to heat it. But the only reason would be that you kept jumping in before the thermostat could do its trick. And for most people I meet, the reason that they think they've got to do something about stress, the reason they think they're responsible for their worry and anxiety, and they need to do something about it, is because they've been trying to do something about it for so long, they've lost sight of the fact that it'll take care of itself if you let it. The natural state of the mind is calm. Now, not that there's not noise in it, but there's noise in something that's already still. I, I host a radio show in the States, and it's a call-in radio show, and people call in to ask me questions about their life and their work and things. And I had a woman call once, and she was wound tight. And she was like, right, okay, I know I, know I only have a couple minutes, but I, I wanted to ask you about my, my work and also my uh, boyfriend and also my kids and also my uh, uh, arm is really sore, I have a frozen shoulder. And, all, and she just went and went and went. And I, I stopped her and I, I asked her a question. I said, if I gave you a bottle uh, 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 or a glass of, of dirty water, murky water, and I asked you to make it clear, how would you do it? And she thought for a second, she said, well, I'd boil it. Which, if you think about it, would give you really hot, boiling, dirty water. <laughs> right? Well, all you need to do if you've got a glass of dirty water and you want to make it clear is let it sit because the nature of water is clear and everything else just settles. The nature of our minds is quiet. And if we let it, the thinking naturally settles. 
and then we're clear-minded. And when we're clear-minded, two things happen. We can see what's actually in front of us, and there's space for something new to come to mind. If you have a problem in your work that feels unsolvable, if you have a problem with your kids that you have racked your brains and you don't know what to do, if you see a problem in the world around you that you really want to do something about and you've tried everything, the one thing you probably haven't tried is nothing, is allowing the mind to settle and allowing something to come to mind. That's actually how we're designed. That's the nature of the mind. So I mentioned that I call what I do a transformative conversation. A transformative conversation is a meaningful conversation about the nature of the human experience. Now what makes a conversation meaningful is that it makes a difference. Right? If something doesn't make any difference to us, it's not very meaningful. If it makes a big difference, it's very meaningful. So this is not philosophy I'm talking with you. This is the nature of the mind. And if you see something about it, it will make a difference in how you live your life and what you're able to do and what you're able to get out of yourself and what you're able to get out of others and what you begin to get out of your life. Now we've talked about aliveness, intelligence, the mind as a principle. We've talked about consciousness, this capacity to be aware as a principle. Well, there's a third fundamental truth about all human beings. We think. Have you ever noticed that? Right? We think all day long. It's always going, this thing. Right? Now, sometimes we're conscious of our thoughts and we can put words to them. Sometimes it's just brain noise. Like my next door neighbor is um, the head of the neurology department at UCLA in Los Angeles. And so he's in charge of the MRI machines. And one of the ways that they know a human being is alive is brain activity, thought. As long as you are alive, you're thinking, whether you're aware of that thinking or not, whether that thinking is in your consciousness or not. Now that's not a problem, that's how we're made. The problem is, when we get so caught up in that thinking, when we get so lost in that thinking that we lose our way. So I talked about the clear glass of water. Let me give you another analogy for that. Right? So imagine that you're walking down the street on a, 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 a nice day, and, and a car comes whipping around the corner. This actually has happened to me three or four times since I got to Athens, and almost runs you over. Right? And you jump out of the way and the car screeches the brakes and you notice that they've got mud all over their windshield. And they're nice enough to roll down their window and mud glops off the window and they apologize. And you go, what's, what's your hurry? Where are you going? And they go, I'm so sorry. I just found out my friend is in hospital. I need to get there. And you say, I get it. Let me help you out. Well, you clean the windscreen, right? because then there's a much better chance they'll get where they're going. But we think the solution is drive faster. We're made to work really well if we work with how well we're made. So if we understand that thought is a constant, then we can begin to work with thought instead of having thought overwhelm us all the time. We can recognize, in a way, what we're up against. Because here's how thought works. This is an analogy. This isn't literally how thought works. Thought works like a movie. Right? Thought is designed with consciousness to appear real. So that's why you can think yourself upset. You can think yourself happy. You can think yourself sad. You can scare the shit out of yourself. Right? That's the power of thought. Thought and consciousness. Thought's like the, the, the script, and consciousness is like the special effects department.
right? It, it brings it to life and makes it seem so real that, that we react to it as if it's really happening. And then if we know it's a movie, we're okay because we can just ride out the movie. If we think it is real, we have to do something about it. So I, have you ever been to a movie and there's, there's a scene, it's a, like a, a horror movie, right? And there's a scene where uh, the pretty girl, on her own, maybe with her boyfriend, and they hear a noise in the basement. And she goes, I know what I'll do. I'll go check it out. Let me take this old rusty flashlight that the batteries don't work very well. And, you know, starts to go down there, and you're thinking, no! Right? Now, people will even shout out at the screen, no! But they know it's a movie. Right? That's kind of part of why it's enjoyable, is they know nothing bad's really going to happen. They have sufficient consciousness to dis dis discern between the movie and reality. Well, most of us don't make any discernment between thought and reality, because they feel the same. Right? You imagine something, I don't know, if you've got a pet, like imagine being with your pet. Probably feels really nice. Unless you have like one of our pets that pees everywhere and eats furniture. But generally speaking, right, it's, it's a really lovely thing. If you imagine an argument you had with somebody recently, you could probably get pretty upset pretty quickly. Now that's not a problem, that's just how thought works. It only becomes a problem if you lose sight of the fact that it's a movie if you lose sight of the fact that we live in the feeling of our thinking, but we think we're living in reality. We think our feelings are telling us about what's really happening. But biologically, that's not how we're made. There is no mechanism in you that would cause looking at a number on a piece of paper to make you feel anything. But I bet there are times where you've looked at your bank balance and you've felt stuff. Well, that's not your bank balance. That's thought. That's how thought works. That's how the mind works. The thing that people almost always want to do is fix it. Okay, what do I do about it? Right? How do I control it? How do I get myself to think this instead of that? But that's like going to a movie and saying, how do I get the girl to not go down into the basement? You can't. You're not in charge of the movie. We're not really in charge of what goes on up here. But we can wake up to it. We can catch on to it. And when we do, it settles down all by itself. So you'll have all sorts of thoughts for the rest of your life. Because you're human, and that's what we do. But the extent to which you get hypnotized by those thoughts, you get sucked in by those thoughts, those thoughts obsess you and ruin your life and block your windshield and make it difficult for you to navigate, well, that's just a function of noticing. That's just a function of understanding. That's just a function of waking up a little bit to how we work. Now, Again, if you know, we, we could. If 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 you've got a glimpse of this, the way that you'll probably know you're catching a glimpse of what I'm talking about is at some level, you'll feel a little bit settled down. You'll feel a little bit hopeful. You'll feel a little bit of a sense of possibility. And what that feeling is, is the feeling of waking up a little bit. And that's really what the answer in the broad sense is to how do I get more out of myself? How do I get more out of others? How do I get more out of my life? Is when I wake up to what's really going on, then more of my natural capacity comes through. The reason I love the phrase unleash your potential is because the limit isn't your potential. It's that we hold ourselves back through misunderstanding. We hold ourselves back through over-efforting. We hold ourselves back by trying too hard to let ourselves go. 
right? It takes no effort to let go. It's natural. It's automatic. But if we think letting go means it'll all fall apart, we're not going to do it. Or it will take will. Or it will take practice. If we get that that's just how it works, we're done. Let me give you an analogy. Okay. Imagine you go to work the same way every day. And it takes an hour and the traffic is horrible. Is that hard to imagine here? <laughs> no. Okay. Now, imagine I could show you a shortcut that would get you to work in 10 minutes, no traffic. How many times would I need to show you the shortcut before you started taking it? One time. Even if you'd been going to work the same way for 30 years, even if your parents went to work the old way, even if your friends all went to work the old way, as soon as we see an easier way, we automatically take it. As soon as you wake up to how well we're made, you will automatically begin to function differently. Now, I want to do two last things, and then I'm going to wrap up, and then we're going to have a little Q&A, a little chance for some questions. So the, 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 the first thing is I did want to give you, having said that this isn't about prescriptions, I know everybody really wants prescriptions. So let me give you three quick things for how to get more out of yourself how to get more out of others, how to get more out of your life. If you want to get more out of yourself, the simplest thing I know to do is let go of trying to figure things out. As soon as you let go of trying to figure out what to do about whatever is preoccupying you, whatever you're obsessing about, your mind will settle and something new will come to mind. It might take 30 seconds, but it's that simple because it's how we're made. If you want to get more out of others, and I, I hate how simple this one is, care. There's a philosopher named Aldous Huxley. And he was asked to sum up his life's work at the end of his life. And he said, it's a little bit embarrassing given everything that I've studied and everything I've written, that the best thing I have to offer is be kind. When we care, people feel it. And when they feel our care, they settle down. And when they settle down, they do better. When we actually care, people sense it. And they become more open to putting up with our shit. They become more willing to let us be human too. Because they get it. Because we all get it. Because we all have bad days and good days. When people sense that you actually care, they're really kind of wanting. It's, it's built into us to want to help. And it's amazing how that's the last place people look. They get strategies for motivation, strategies, rewards, and punishments, and all of this clever stuff to manipulate people, right? They learn rapport strategies to sit the way the other person is sitting and hold their hands the way the other person is holding to create a sense of rapport. Yeah, you can do all that, or you can care. You can take the time to listen. You can take the time to get to know the people that you want to get more out of and you'll find that they respond. There was a famous experiment in Hawthorne, Massachusetts in the 1930s, and they call it the Hawthorne effect, where they wanted to see what made a difference to the efficiency of an assembly line. And so what they did was they tried all of these different things. So they tried improving the lighting with one group, and then they tried um, giving more breaks to another group, and they tried 10 different things and what they found made the difference was the extra attention they gave to the groups. The very fact that the groups were participating in the experiment made them perform better because they felt like somebody cared. If you want to get more out of your life, there's a, a quote that's become my absolute favorite quote in the world. And it's from George Bernard Shaw, the British playwright. 
And he said, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. Instead of a selfish, feverish clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. We are made to be lived. We are made to be of use. And if we allow ourselves to be, whether that use is something that the world notices or that use is something that we know, we notice, we come alive. And what the world needs is people who have come alive. I want to read one last thing. I want to give you one last thing. This is where I'm going to finish. And this is from the book, The Inside Out Revolution. And this is a story at the end, a sort of a, a parable. And it's called The Life Coach and the Mighty Tree. Now, my children always said when I read them bedtime stories, Dad, don't do the voices. <laughs> well, I'm going to do a little bit of the voices. It actually starts with a quote from Pericles, which I totally forgot, and that's not just for the Greek edition. What you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. One day, while sitting with my back against the trunk of a massive tree in my garden, I fell asleep and dreamed that I was sitting with my back against the trunk of a massive tree in my garden. Much to my surprise, it asked me for some coaching. I am a mighty tree, I began, it began, and, and I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit that a few of my leaves have begun to fall to the ground. The thing is, I can't afford to lose my leaves. What will people think of me if I go bald? They'll see me as naked and weak and frail. I'm not sure I can go on if it means going through such a difficult ordeal. But tree, I replied, surely you must realize that this is just part of the seasons of life. Each autumn, you lose your leaves. That's why we humans call it fall. And come spring, you'll grow new leaves and return more beautiful than ever. How can you say such things with such certainty, asked the tree. Are you some kind of a psychic or fortune teller? No, tree, I'm not psychic. I'm simply an observer of life. And I've noticed the natural cycle with all trees of your kind. In fact, everywhere I look in nature, I see the same kind of pre-existing intelligence at work behind the scenes. You're not talking about God, are you? Asked the tree. I'm not sure that I want to get into a discussion about God with a human. Neither do I, tree. Neither do I. When I say pre-existing intelligence, I mean the implicate order of things. As you know, acorns never grow into pine trees and baby rabbits never grow up to be grizzly bears. Somehow, the fruit is already programmed into the seed. We humans can observe that intelligence at work in our body the moment we get cut. The intelligence of the body begins the process of healing. There's an intelligence behind our mind as well. The moment we think a toxic thought, we get a toxic feeling as a warning signal not to proceed too far down that path. Healthy thoughts produce healthy feelings, letting us know we're heading in a healthy direction. This inner compass guides us back to a state of natural health and equilibrium. In this state, we have access to an otherwise hidden wisdom that will guide us if we let it. Then why is there so much war and cruelty and unrest in your world, the tree asked. Surely that's proof that no such intelligence exists. Unfortunately, not everyone yet understands the inside-out nature of reality and the simple intelligence behind the system. So there's still a lot of mental instability in the world. But it seems to me the fact that no matter how long people have suffered, they're never more than one thought away from peace is proof of the kindness of the design. The tree stared down at me, inscrutably, as if it could hold that pose for a thousand years without wavering. And then finally it spoke. But even if this wisdom and intelligence exists, it's not infallible. Humans die, and so do trees. If there is, as you say, a kindness to the design, how do you explain death? It was my turn to stare back up at the tree. I can't explain it, I replied honestly, but I can observe it and see the impersonal nature of it. 
And somehow seeing that it's part of the nat natural cycle for everyone and everything suggests to me that even death, at some level I can't yet see, is a part of the implicate order. Perhaps in some way, it's even a part of the kindness of the design. We sat quietly together, the tree and I, feeling connected, not only by my back against its trunk, but by a deeper bond of shared contemplation and mortality. Our conversation is ongoing. The more I look in this direction, the more I realize how little I see. But somehow, the little I see makes my life better and better. With all my love, Michael. Thank you.